Welcome back to the Career Now podcast and welcome back to our literature series, which we ran last summer. Um, today's guest is a returning guest and a guest from that literature series as well. And I will link the podcast that we did together at that time below. This is Ross King, Professor of Korean Languages and Korean Literature at the University of British Columbia and a fascinating author on a huge number of research that on James Scarth Gale, which we're going to be speaking about today. So, Ross, welcome back to the podcast. Nice to be back with you. Thanks. So as a signpost, just to get this going, there's going to be some people out there who have got no idea who James Scarth Gale is. And uh, just to let things go and let it build up from there, who was he? And as the podcast continues, we can build up much more of the details about his character. Sure. Uh, so James Scarth Gale was a Canadian uh, missionary, with, and he worked for the Presbyterians. And he was, he's born in 1863. He graduated from University of Toronto in 1888. And uh, very soon thereafter, uh, headed for Korea. So he was one of the first Protestant missionaries in Korea. And he was in Korea for 40 years until 1927. So he was there during some really, he saw a lot of change uh, in those four decades, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, he was kind of special amongst the missionaries because, first of all, he, he, he was very good with um, languages in general, and he was um, well known as one of the better speakers of Korean. <clears throat> and so he ended up doing um, a lot of what they called the literary work. So he, he wrote, you know, the mother of all Korean dictionaries, uh, Korean English dictionaries. Uh, he, you know, he, he went through three different um, editions of a Korean to English di dictionary. The last one came out in the early 1930s. He wrote uh, teaching grammars that were originally targeted at the missionaries. So he sort of wrote about grammar and um, he did tons of translation, both um, from Korean and from uh, Hanmun, from literary Sinitic or classical Chinese into English and the other way. He translated um, with some of the Korean Christians. He worked with um, various things from English into Korean. So he was um, not so much saving souls as um, working with uh, texts and translation and, and literature. So what else can I say about James Garth Gale? He was a little bit... Um, uh, he wasn't quite so, um, shall we say, doctrinal or territorial as some of the other missionaries. He um, had friends across different denominations. He was close to um, the French Catholic bishop, Mutel. He was very close to the um, Anglicans, hung out with the Methodists. The Methodists really liked him. And um, he was a little bit more... Uh, kind of a, a free spirit. Uh, I mean, still theologically pretty conservative as they all were, but um, probably the, the one missionary that you might want to sit down and have a beer with. And in fact, he was known later in life to have enjoyed sitting down with a beer, although that would have been in retirement. So I don't know, that that's kind of a real quick overview. Anyway, for, he's Canadian, worked for the Americans. That's a good way to start. And uh, I might jump straight from that. And of course, as I said, we will build up a lot more detail about him throughout sure. this, but I might come back to you actually, because you have got a very interesting story about this research as well. So I believe um, you said it's around 2004, you were reading a book by Richard Rutt and there were some clues in there that this Gale archive oh, yeah, existed. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. Rutt Mm. He, he was uh, sort of in that line of Anglican bishops that Gale was already kind of had befriended uh, when he was in Korea. And Gale uh, in the early 70s wrote a very nice um, edition of Gale's History of the Korean People, which had appeared sort of in serial form in the Korea Mission Field, which was the, um, the, the magazine that all the missionaries read for all things Korean. And he had sort of serialized this uh, in the 30s, never put it together as a book. So Gale went back and, and you know, edited it up as a book. And then in front of, uh, at the beginning of that book, he had written this very nice kind of potted biography of James Scarth Gale. Um, but then it had this very rich apparatus in the back of the book where it became clear that uh, Bishop Rutt had sat down over some weeks um, in the, the basement of Gale's son, who lived in Montreal at the time in the 1970s, 
and where all of Gail's personal papers were. And it was clear from the footnotes, I mean, sort of left, if you will, lots of um, sort of uh, breadcrumbs, right? Sort of the Hansel, uh, Hansel and Gretel type mm-hmm. thing saying, oh, well, you know, there's so much more stuff there. There's this, there's that and the other. And um, no one seemed to have, uh, have followed up. And so this was now, oh, 40 years after Rutt had written that. And the sort of attitude in the field was that, oh, Gail, been there, done that. You know, Richard Rutt did it and there's not much more to do. And um, so I poked around online and discovered that only just uh, – not well, not you know, within the last sort of decade from when I was looking in the early 2000s, that the University of Toronto uh, Fisher Rare Book Library had posted a kind of finder list to the Gale papers. And so, oh, okay, so there, you know, the papers are now with the University of Toronto. So it turns out that the son, George, had, um, you know, basically turned over all of Gale's um, papers, and it's a lot. Uh, to the University of Toronto, and there was a finder list. I said, "Okay, let's let's go and check it out." And when I my original idea was, "Oh, you know, since I'm most mostly a linguist or used to be, uh, maybe there's sort of interesting unpublished stuff about language and linguistics." Um, so I, you know, booked a flight to Toronto, went to the library. It's a ton of stuff. And spent a week with the papers um, just to sort of see what was there and basically realized after I'd looked at it all that um, there was very little uh, of any interest to a linguist. There was very little, in fact, of interest to church historians, um, uh, you know, which is a big field in Korea. There's a, it's almost this sort of cottage industry of all these you know, scholars who are themselves Christians sort of uh, excavating the history of, of Christianity in Korea. And they've dug up most stuff, but they have sort of avoided Gale. And uh, I realized why, which is because if you look at his papers, he doesn't really talk much about mission and about church or about theology. Uh, But what it was, what I found was he had something like uh, 20 ledgers, these big, uh, you know, Korean sort of ledgers from the 19 teens and 20s that were sort of household account ledgers. They're you know, much bigger than like a legal pad size, and they have about 200 pages in them. And he had used these as all manuscript, all in his own handwriting. Uh, it was basically, they were his holding tanks for all of his different writing projects. So there were translations of just, I mean, uh, of basically mostly works of Korean literature written in literary Semitic, um, some vernacular stuff. Some of his diaries, uh, some of his, you know, personal correspondence, uh, book lists, because he was always chasing down old, you know, antiquarian Korean books. Um, but it all typed up probably 4,000 pages of stuff, plus um, other folders of typed up things that weren't published that he was hoping to publish. And so what sort of emerged was this um, this. 30-year project, let's let's call it, starting from the 1890s until the 1930s, um, of everything that he had worked on uh, in the way of pre-modern Korean uh, literature and history. And basically, no one had really looked at it except for Rutt, and Rutt had... um, you know, d- did what he could with some of it um, and then moved on to other projects and, and no one sort of followed the trail. So that's where it all started was with this trip to um, Toronto back in, I don't know, 2003 or four, five. And I might get into what you did there because I think you're understating just how important uh, the work you did there was and how important this field is. Because I, I, I might quote here from you. You mentioned the, the finder list here. And you and this is a quote from an article of yours. The first thing that was obvious from the finder list was that its complier knew nothing of Korea, Korean language or Korean literature. So in some ways, it was completely misleading what was written on this right. finder list. And so in that yeah. sense, so this lost this work was kind of lost to the doldrums. It really is not saying too much to say that this really was a, a, a lost kind of history. That you, that you discovered. Well, yeah, it was it was kind of mis um, miscatalogued or kind of uh, misdescribed, if you will, um, because the, the the bulk of the good stuff were, is those ledgers, and in the finders list it says, "Oh, they're they're his diaries," but they're actually not diaries at all. Um, they have nothing to do with diaries. They're, they're literally kind of uh, you know just oodles and oodles of of poetry and 
history and of prose and fiction and sort of, uh, you know, uh, tales, uh, uh, some of the folk tales, uh, folk literature, myths, all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's essentially an entire library of pre or pre 20th century um, Korean uh, literary culture is what it was. Um, but there's no way you really could have known that looking at, at, at the way it was written up because whoever did it just didn't know what was there. And the other thing is that some of the Korean scholars, you know, from the church history field had sort of made the trek to Toronto and concluded that, there, you know, there just wasn't much to do there. Um, and that's because they don't, you know, they're not literary uh, scholars. They also don't know um, uh, literary Sinetic. They don't know Hanmun. And so, yeah, it was kind of overlooked. It was passed over. And uh, another thing I've gathered from your research here, this is an interesting one, considering um, the, the important place of Gail. You write, despite all this, this hidden archive that you discovered, that even the published works of Gail are not so easily find, uh, uh, not so easily to be found today. True. Um, well, so, I mean, when, while he was alive, um, he... First of all, he had trouble even publishing a fraction of what he had done. Um, and that's partly because he wasn't really, you know, he wasn't a scholar with, you know, he wasn't at a, uh, he wasn't a professor at a university. Furthermore, he was studying a country that was colonized by Japan, uh, where, you know, he didn't have kind of any clout behind him. And basically no one outside of Korea was much interested in Korea. So convincing um, publishers to publish any of his stuff was not, easy. I mean, and in a, in a way, that's still true today. Um, if you look at some of our better translators of, of pre-modern, say, Korean poetry, like, like Kevin O'Rourke, who, who just recently passed away, um, who admired uh, Gail greatly, um, he you know, had trouble placing his really excellent translations with decent publishers um, throughout his uh, long life as well. And so Gail had this, pro this problem of, of publishing things, but then, you know, it was almost 100 years ago that he was publishing. And so they're, they're kind of collector's items now. They're, they're, they're bibliographic rarities. And, uh, and it, although in the, the one, there is one case, and, I mean, the good news is that what little he did manage to publish in his lifetime is now out of copyright because it's so old. So that in a couple cases, you can now buy, for example, his um, excellent translation of the uh, the Dream Cloud of the Nine, the Kuun Mong, which is kind of a, one of it's now considered a classic of of pre modern Korean uh, fiction. Uh, there's probably three or four different uh, editions you can buy now on Amazon because it's out of copyright. And so you know, sort of unscrupulous publishers have just kind of said, okay, we'll reprint that because we know. There are people that might buy it for courses or whatever. Um, so, uh, but other things are harder to find. Some of his earlier things from the 1890s and so on. Yeah. And you mentioned a little earlier the word Hanmun. I'll get to explain exactly what that is, but it, it is important because um, this is some of the Gale. Um, he, he seemed to have a real disdain for the vernacular language and he really. Um, pushed incredibly hard that um, Han Moon was the way or was the, um, well, the core of Korean literature in some ways. Um, yes and no. So, so uniquely, uh, virtually uniquely among the Western missionaries, he learned um, Han Moon or, you know, basically it's classical Chinese. Uh, but for reasons that would take another podcast, I, I try not to use the word Chinese anymore because it's just not a very helpful word. Um, so let's call it literary Sinitic, or let's just call it Hanmun, which is what the Koreans call it. But the point is, is it's not Korean. It's not vernacular. And um, virtually everything published up until the 20th century uh, of any value was published in literary Sinitic or, you know, or in Hanmun, not in the vernacular. And traditionally, the, the Korean sort of educated uh, people, the literati, also, they sort of held uh, vernacular literature in disdain. Now, Gale, because he was a missionary and, and you know, and he was a, a smart one, it's not that he held the vernacular in disdain um, so much. I mean, because for proselytizing purposes, you, you had to have the vernacular. And so the missionaries were very strongly uh, pro you know, vernacular, uh, um, although let's not say pro Hangul because the missionaries still didn't know that word until like 1935. Um, but anyway, they were pro vernacular um, and wanted to publish everything that they wrote uh, in the way of proselytizing materials in the vernacular. 
which makes sense. However, Gale and also Underwood, to Underwood's credit, were the two dissenting voices who early on said, you know what, if we want to win over the intellectuals and the educated class, especially those educated you know, before the 20th century who know uh, Hanmun, uh, we need a mixed script version of the Bible. In other words, not a pure Hangul version, not a pure vernacular uh, rendition, but something where anything that can be rendered in sinographs, in Chinese characters, uh, is done so to make it more palatable uh, to, you know, the educated class uh, who we need on our side. This was uh, what Underwood and Gale said, and they were voted down, basically. Um, so when uh, later after Gale is sort of at the very end of the 19 teens, when he resigned from the um, Bible translation committee because he was fed up with their very sort of fundamentalist and literalist, uh, you know, word for word kind of approach to translating the Bible, he then undertook a second uh, personal, private, unauthorized translation of, of the Bible from the beginning you know, to the very end again with one of his closest associates, and that's in mixed script, which so you see you'll you will find um, sinographs uh, in his uh, unauthorized uh, translation, which came out in 1925. But so at some point when he, uh, when he first got to Korea, um, you know, he basically said, "Okay, I'm going to learn Korean. I'm going to learn the vernacular." And somewhere between sort of 1895, 1900 or so, you know, we know from his letters that he had started to learn um, Hanmun, um, and he, he started to take it very seriously. So by 1901, between I think 1901 and 1905, he and Yi Chang Jik, who was his um, first a uh, Korean language teacher who was traditionally trained, uh, a, a really good scholar of um, literary Sinitic. They, uh, for example, published a series of textbooks uh, for teaching Hanmun, for teaching literary Sinitic and, you know, sinographs to the students at the Kyungshin uh, Boys School, which was uh, run by uh, Gale. Uh, at that point. And um, it's there, it, even just th that they thought to include that in missionary education is really interesting. And then, of course, the way that they went about it, making it very Korea focused and the texts they read were, were famous texts by Korean writers in literary Sinitic rather than just reading stuff from China. Um, you know, it's a very different angle. And so, um, Unfortunately, uh, because of modern day Korean nationalism and script nationalism, especially the sort of modern day Korean cult of Hangul, when um, Koreans today look back on the missionaries and on sort of the, the rise of the vernacular, um, they demonize Hanmun, they demonize Hancha or Sinographs, and sort of tend to write out of the story anybody who might have thought otherwise. And that's one reason uh, or another reason that Gale um, has been to a certain extent overlooked or sort of, um, what's the word, just kind of left out of the picture. Um, because, and instead, you know, what they do is I'll talk about uh, this other missionary who's an American, uh, Holbert, Homer Holbert, you know, mm. um, who, you know, because he, he, he lionized the vernacular script and said all these great things about Hangul. So, you know, everybody likes to talk about him because it plays into this 20th century uh, Korean nationalist narrative of the inevitable, you know, triumph of, of Hangul over, over these evil sinographs. Uh, Gail, Gail had a different view, and his view was actually closer to what, um, you know, intellectuals at the time were thinking. And it's a fact now that, you know, most Koreans today are completely cut off from that, you know, 1500 years of, of literary heritage that's all in uh, literary Sinetic. A very um, important follow-up from that is um, in such a vast archive, if there is a central theme, and uh, of course this is unlikely to be a central theme, but through your writing here, there seems to be something that was certainly nagging in the back of Gail's mind throughout a lot of this. And you put it like this, that he was witnessing the death of great literature. And I'm going to quote him here because I think this is a very good quote and very interesting quote. And he's um, really up, he's upset about the, 19, uh, the 1894 Cabo reforms. And he says this, Confucianism died in the night, and so the ship of state slipped its old anchor chains and was adrift. And he seems to be con really convinced that he's living in a time when literature, Korean literature, is dead or dying. Yeah, uh, he, he um, it's a it's a it's a theme that runs through uh, all of his writings uh, right up until 
he leaves Korea in 1927 uh, to retire to England. And uh, um, yeah, uh, he, he, he was at great pains to demonstrate to his fellow missionaries and to anybody who would listen that, you know, that the Koreans were a literate people, that they were not, they were not just literate, they were a literary people, and that Korea um, had a great civilization. And, and, and the word civilization really was a key word for uh, Gale. Um, and so uh, another theme that runs through all of his writings is he's always keen to um, put Korean put Korea on a timeline running parallel with, um, with Latinate Europe. So, you know, if, if, he, if he's mentioning uh, a writer that lived at the same time as Shakespeare, he'll give the Korean writers, you know, dates and say, oh, you know, and a, and, um, uh, you know, uh, what sort he uses, not a compatriot, but uh, a contemporary of, of, you know, William Shakespeare. And and oftentimes even sort of going so far as to say, if you get back into like Schilla or even uh, Cordio, that, you know, at a time when, you know, Europeans, you know, were in the dark ages, you know, Koreans were publishing books and writing literature and, you know, uh, basically creating this great civilization. Um, so he, 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 um, Rather than, as so many missionaries and Westerners did and do, just assume that Korea was like this hunter-gatherer society with no culture and no history, um, in, uh, no, 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 uh, you know, this was a, a, a truly great civilization with a great literature, um, and I, you know, I'm going to translate, you know, widely, you know, and broadly from it to, to show that to you. Uh, but unfortunately, um, most people just weren't interested, and, and certainly publishers uh, were not. Um, but, I mean, quite apart from the, the, the this idea that um, something died in 1894 when they, that's the year, among other reforms that year is when they, you know, they, they basically abolished the, the traditional civil service examination, which meant, therefore, there was absolutely no reason for Korean men, uh, young men, to learn literary Sinitic anymore. And so that for him was, was a real turning point. Um, but, you know, like all of these other missionaries who were theologically and, you know, essentially socially very conservative, this is a time when they were just that they thought all of the world was going to hell in a handbasket. And so he also complains about the rise of socialism and Bolshevism and communism. And, you know, you know, it's not just Korean literature he's concerned about. He had a, a general kind of issue with, uh, you know, modernity and, you know, telegraphs, the motor car, all these things, and all these newfangled things kind of rattled him. Um, that important point you made about how he's always trying to contemporize uh, Korean society with um, the Western world. And it brings me to a next question here, because whenever someone arrives, especially in that era, arrives in a, in a country and falls in love the way that Gale did, or at least seems to have done throughout his writings, People are very quick to lob the charge of Orientalism back at this and say this, this is its own form of bigotry in some ways. So uh, what do you make of that? I, I have heard my own just in casual conversations with historians. And they say uh, he was an, Orient an Orientalist. I'm not sure if they were committed to the idea or whether it's just a passing comment. Well, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a number, it's a really good question. And, and it had, you know, it's the elephant in the room. Um, so, you know, ever since Edward Said's book uh, on Orientalism, the word uh, Orientalist has become a dirty word. Um, and it, it needn't be, um, you know, that, that's, you know, he and everybody else at that time had certain, you know, Orientalist and, you know, racist uh, uh, ideas. Uh, everybody did. Um, the um, uh, where was I already going with that? Well, so was he an Orientalist? Um, sure, he was. Um, but um, I had a, a brilliant answer on the tip of my tongue, and it just <laughs> slipped my mind. Uh, what was the first part of the question? Uh, I, I was I was saying whenever someone falls in love with a country like this, then it is always um, oh, so sorry, I, I remember now. And of course, you made the the contemporary um, analogy to the Western world, which for me would 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 indicate this is a man not being all that right. Um, so so there's, there's two ways in which he was very much not uh, a, a typical Orientalist, and the one is that he did not deny 
coevalness to the Koreans. So this is this idea that, you know, uh, when the Europeans were doing this in the 13th century, here's what the Koreans were doing. You know, they were every, you know, uh, every step along the way, you know, as good as or better than what was happening in Europe. So, um, you know, there, there, there's this notion, I think it's an anthropologist who came up with the term, but this idea of the denial of coevalness. This is a classic Orientalist, imperialist, cult, colonialist kind of idea that when you go somewhere, the natives are denied uh, coevalence. They don't belong in the same, on the same temporal plane as us white people. He did not buy that at all and spent his whole career trying to prove that it was not the case. And then the other thing about falling in love with, you know, with literature in you know, classical Chinese, if you will, um, every single taste that Gale might have had, every single predilection he would have for a certain author or a certain kind of text or a certain genre he got from the Koreans around him. This was not like he just made this up. He didn't have, you know, I mean, he was guided very carefully and, could have, and couldn't have done any of this work without um, the five or six or seven or so um, devoted and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Christian yet traditionally trained uh, Koreans that sat down every morning with him for like two or three hours before breakfast and read texts with him. So that, uh, you know, if you want to, you know, accuse him of certain kinds of Orientalism, uh, then you've got a, a, you know, that applies to everybody he was working with. Um, you know, including the Koreans. I mean, it was the Koreans around him that were dictating that kind of, of taste. Um, so, you know, uh, we're all Orientalists. Uh, uh, this idea of creating a, a, a of, cr of creating a body of texts and uh, and and conferring upon it uh, some sort of canonical status is in its very core an Orientalist move that every modern literary culture has learned from Europe. So in one sense, and this is Amir Mufti has written about this, uh, we're all Orientalists. And so he was too. Um, but uh, in, in some of the core ideas of what we uh, think of as Orientalism, uh, he just, he, 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 he resisted uh, um, uh, very interestingly. I really hope you're enjoying this episode of the podcast and I apologize for this interruption, but I'm just going to take this moment to remind our listeners that we've made a conscious decision here in the Korean App Podcast not to run advertising in any way. So if you do enjoy the podcast and you listen regularly and you do want it to continue, it is important that you do your best to support us at the links below or by sharing, liking or commenting on the podcast across social media. All your help in this regard is invaluable. And now back to the episode. And we should come to what he loved so much about Korea, is seeing that we've touched on that there. And it, it, it should come back to that question I asked earlier about um, uh, him, him considering that uh, Korean literature was dying here. And this is important because he doesn't see this as just some parochial part of the academic arts in some ways. He, has, um, he really looks at Korea as a different kind of country to that of countries like Japan. He, I, I believe that you've written somewhere uh, that he saw Japan Japan is a country of the warrior, whereas Korea was a country of the scholar. So when he says that Korean literature is dying, he's actually saying Korea itself is dying in some ways. Yeah, and he was also, he was very critical of, so I mean, remember that he's kind of there at a time before um, modern Korean literature has crystallized, right? So usually when people talk about the rise of, say, modern Korean fiction, we're talking about the 1920s with Kim Dong-in and where he, they finally settle on a kind of new, uh, say, uh, a, a new literary style for, you know, what, what does um, modern literary Korean look like? What sentence, ending, what sentence endings does it use, for example? Um, and that hadn't really crystallized until the 1920s. And he only, you know, he left in 1927. So he's there during this period of great flux in terms of what counts as literature and when there isn't really yet a, um, a fully formed uh, modern Korean literature. And he was very critical of of the experimentation that was going on precisely because it was so heavily influenced by Japanese. And so um, when he, uh, after he resigned from the Bible Translation Committee, which I think I had mentioned earlier, um, he spent the rest of his, uh, uh, like his last five years or so in Korea, 1922 to 1927, he worked for the Christian Literature Society. And he had three full-time 
uh, Korean pundits, he called them, um, that worked with him, you know, that were on salary. And then they were vetting uh, texts that would be submitted, you know, for publication by the Christian Literature Society, publication in Korean. And he and his men, uh, um, his, his three pundits, um, would meet every morning to discuss the latest submissions to the, uh, the Christian Literature Society. And he kept a ledger uh, with notes uh, of all of the, of what they, you know, he, he and especially the three guys he worked with, what they had to say about the literary style, the writing style of this newfangled kind of Korean that young writers were playing with. And they're, they, they just excoriated. I mean, it, on, on the one hand, it's very conservative. But to, to Gale and to the men he worked with, um, the sort of style of the traditional vernacular Korean storybook, that was good literature. That was good Korean style um, with endings like they were in the Bible. Um, and whereas the new stuff that came out um, was all newfangled endings that no one ever used in writing before, like Hayata, Handa, Heta, that, that's very new and in, in a way kind of contrived. Um, and definitely had sort of smells Japanese or did at the time. Now, so in other words, basically, if you ask Gail now, he would look at modern Korean short, you know, short fiction or any kind of fiction and just sort of, you know, say, if you scratch it with your, you know, fingernail below the surface, it's all Japanese. And that's also true of the vocabulary because, uh, you know, uh, if you will, uh, modern 20th century Korean kind of heavily relexified, kind of changed a lot of its learned vocabulary to basically just downloaded it from modern Japanese who had kind of made up all these new, um, you know, words, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years before in the Meiji period. So, and this was quite offensive to Gale. I mean, he, he felt that Korea had its own resources to do this. And in his own translations that he did with his Korean pundits, they tried to come up with a different kind of of literary style in Korean. As, as it turns out, of course, they didn't have any you know, money behind them. It was a very small niche kind of <clears throat> rear guard uh, you know, action. And of course they lost. And uh, the, the style that Kim Dong-in and people like him were writing won the day, uh, but Gail hated it. And, and so, uh, and he saw it and he, and, and his, um, the intellectuals he worked with saw this as very much um, an imposition by Japan. Or, or a kind of poor imitation on the part of uh, unimaginative Koreans of something fr imported from Japan. Now, you mentioned there that he made extensive notes about the work of his co-translators, his Korean co-translators. And I think this is probably an important point to, dwin to um, dwell on here, just because it, it goes to say a lot about the person that he was, because I have to assume, and I, I believe you've written about it as well, that at the time, this was incredibly uncommon for people to actually give um, publication credit to um, Korean co-translators. Right. So all of the missionaries that were doing any kind of literary work, like Mrs. Underwood, uh, for example, uh, there were others, um, you know, they, they worked, they were assigned, they, you know, they, they hired um, full-time kind of secretaries, they would call them. Uh, Gail called them pundits because he was kind of looking back to a, a, a similarly ori missionary orientalist tradition in India where, you know, the, the missionaries, the Western missionaries in India always worked closely with pundits who taught them Sanskrit or whatever other languages, local languages that they were working in. Um, so he had his, his pundits, but when he co-translated with them, uh, most of the time he, they were listed as co-translators. And, if, and sometimes even wrote the, um, the sort of preface uh, to the book. Whereas, um, so far as I've seen, uh, that that happened rare, you know, rarely, if ever, with other missionaries. So there, we, you know, in some cases, uh, we know that certain missionaries did work with, um, you know, Koreans together when they translated things, but we just don't, don't even know their names. Uh, and even with Gail, we, we know their names. We know that uh, they were close family friends, that they were, uh, you know, in, uh, members of the family that he, you know, what he, he would, um, you know, participate in or even preside over weddings of their children. Um, you know, the, 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 he, he, they were very dear to him. Uh, and in fact, uh, he, he waxes very poetic and clearly very, uh, is very distraught in 1925 when one of his pundits uh, passes away 
uh, who had been teaching uh, Han Moon at uh, Chosen Christian College, which, which is now Yonsei University. So these were close friends, and he he he, he valued their work. He valued their intellects. Uh, would write specifically about them or advocate, you know, for a better salary for them because of the the, the sort of nature of you know and quality of, of the work they were doing. And he would put their names uh, on the the works that they that they that they did together. And in that sense, again. You know, there's no denying of coevalness here. He 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 really did um, want to you know see Korea and its um, literary tradition and prowess as being on a par. Let's talk about Gael as a book collector, and in, and I think this comes in a couple of different directions. His own private collection, which is tricky for him to amass, simply because he doesn't have the funds largely for this, but also because there are a number of organisations that um, uh, employ him to collect rare books for them. And of course, on the other side of this is the competitive place he finds himself in, because as he's trying to do this, he is competing with often uh, Japanese collections and he's completely outmatched in some ways. And he's lamenting that these books are gonna be lost to private collections and never seen again. Yeah. Uh, so he he was very keen on antiquarian uh, Korean books, um, you know, for his research purposes, and essentially became a vicarious collector. So using other people's or other institutions funding, he would, you know, uh, sort of um, mobilize his contacts uh, through um, in the intellectuals he knew and through the Christians he knew uh, to find books. And like you say, he even complains at some point in the early 20s that the market has been stripped by the Japanese because so much has gone to Japan. Um, but, uh, you know, for a while he was, he was um, buying books for the Library of Congress. And so the, the nice collection, it's small uh, and, you know, not tiny, but nothing like say what they have in Paris. Uh, um, but he, he, you know, he, he was the one who collected all those books um, and then passed them on to another gentleman who then sent them on to the Library of Congress. Um, there was another short-lived organization in New York City called the Asiatic Institute of New York, which started off as kind of a, a bunch of diplomats uh, in the United States concerned with the uh, pillaging of Chinese antiquities. Um, but then uh, it was William Rockhill, I think, who was in charge, and uh, Gale had, had come to know him and managed to somehow essentially finagle what I think is the world's, or at least uh, the, the Anglophone world's first ever Korean studies research grant where he got four years of funding that allowed him to hire uh, three scholars full time uh, for four years to, on the one hand, purchase a bunch of books and then amazingly to index them. Uh, and the, the index cards have, are no longer uh, extant. Uh, but the index um, of all these works survives, as do the books. And the books are now in California at uh, Claremont McKenna College. And the actual index has been separated from them and is in the Library of Congress. And so that's a remarkable project, too, that he would, you know, because it's a kind of representative bunch of books. And he was unusual from a lot of other scholars in that he focused on these um, uh, uh, munjip, the, these uh, individual authors kind of collected works from uh, mostly from Chosun. And he, he sort of amassed a bunch of these and a bunch of other books across a wide range of genres. And uh, those books are now sitting in California. And then you've got the books in the Library of Congress. But crucially, and this story is, is not known and is not appreciated in Korea itself, he formed and he chaired the committee that formed the, the nucleus of the rare book collection at Yonsei University, which is the best collection, basically, in Korea today. Um, and uh, that story, unfortunately, is not well known. And, I, you know, I've kind of got it all <coughs> written up, but haven't had a chance to, to publish it. Um, so that's, you know, three kind of major uh, um, collections there. But he also was wheeling and dealing in books with other missionaries like the Anglican bishop, who also he was the, basically the only other missionary who knew uh, Hanmun was um, the Anglican bishop, whose name has just escaped me. Um, but uh, they, they would kind of trade books back and forth. And um, he was clear, you know, he knew all of the key uh, movers and shakers, um, like Tre Nam Son, he would, you know, he, he was getting those books. He clearly had met Tre Nam Son. He knew other people that were in that same um, kind of rare books enterprise led by Tre Nam Son in the 19-teens. So he was right in there. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, it's really hard to find 
concrete mention of Gale in the Korean sources because so often the Korean sources of the period um, essentially write foreigners out of the record. Um, but uh, even like someone like Kim Yoon Shik, very prominent intellectual um, of the time, you know, he, uh, Gale shows up in his Munjip, uh, for example. Um, so yeah, I mean, he he was really well plugged in. He was chasing old books. Uh, he himself didn't have a lot of money because he was just a missionary. But he used other people's money to buy the books. He would kind of hang on to them for a while until his research assistants, if you will, or his pundits could could um, uh, at least index them. And if he, there was things in or they would read from it together. Maybe he would make some translations from it and then eventually pass it on to its final destination. Uh, he himself did not own much at all in the way of, of, of old Korean books. The one book that he cherished the most was his, he did have a copy of the collected works of Igu Bo from the Koryo dynasty. The book is not from the Koryo dynasty, but the, the author was. And uh, he was working on Igu Bo's uh, um, you know, translating from his uh, collected works right up until the time he died. I can almost uh, hear people listen to the podcast now with a thought in their mind. And they'll say, this doesn't sound like the traditional work of what they imagine a missionary to be doing. And of course, throughout your writing as well, you do say that Gail was involved in not just the creation of uh, schools, of missionary schools, but also the administration. So this huge amount of work in Korean literature, it, it wasn't just how how did he have time for this? Because it sounds like it may have been a, a, a part time gig in some ways on the side, but also it seems to be incredibly a full time job. I'm not sure how he balanced all this. Well, I mean, he, he did have his own church. He had his own congregation, which still survives, uh, the Yandong uh, Kyohe, uh, which is actually just around the corner from Sungyun Guan University. That um, church is still there, and he he would preach every Sunday at that church right up until the time he left. Um, so he was busy with his own church and his own congregation. Um, interestingly, we do have his uh, sermon notes survive, um, all the sort of three by five uh, cards with his notes for his sermons. And what's interesting about those is that he was clearly using traditional Korean literature in his sermons. Um, which uh, must have been very interesting to hear. And, and unfortunately, none of them were written out, so we don't know exactly how he did it. Um, but it's uh, almost on a weekly basis. He was citing not just scripture, but, you know, traditional Korean literature in his sermon. So was, his day job was basically working for the Christian Literature Society, which was Again, a literary kind of position, but it was, you know, vetting manuscripts and decide, you know, giving thumbs up, thumbs down on whether the, the CLS should publish it, uh, you know, working with his church. So that's sort of like the nine to five. The, but all of the, the work with the sort of old books and with the translation started at 5 a.m. He, he was an early riser. He would get up at 5 a.m. Um, we know, for example, that the gentleman I talked about who taught Hanmun at, at uh, um, Chosen Christian College actually lived in the Gale compound. So these people were living in the same house. And so they would all get up. And um, his son, George, who I met uh, when he was uh, met him in Montreal, Oh, gosh, maybe 2005. He was 95. He was born in uh, 1911. So I actually met his son, which was quite a, a amazing because that was like the, the closest sort of I've, I've gotten to him, if you will. Um, but his son um, remembers as a child coming down in the morning for breakfast around 7 or 8 p.m. Um, and coming down from upstairs uh, uh, from his bedroom. And at the bottom of the stairs uh, was his father's study. And he says every morning, uh, Gail and um, several men would be seated around a table um, reading from texts and shouting at each other, sort of basically, uh, you know, uh, giving a, a, a running translation of something from Hanmun into Korean and then trying to kind of find the right way to put it into English. So it was kind of a, a group reading project. And he did this every morning for, for years and years. So that was kind of when he, it was the mornings really uh, when he did all that work. Um, during the daytime, he, he did have a, a real job, but it wasn't, he wasn't out there sort of saving souls so much. I mean, he, it was just about his, his personal, you know, his church, the Yundong church. Uh, throughout your all your reading of Gail's work, I wonder if you've sniffed out any kind of um, philosophy of translation within his work, or is it uh, is that um, a little bit uh, 
Um, I'm asking a little bit too much that it, that it doesn't no, exist. No, no. In fact, he had a very clear, a very clearly articulated philosophy of translation. <clears throat> as early as 1892, one of the things you can find in his papers is a sort of, I don't know, two or three page itemized list of, you know, the principles of translation, um, where he says, you know, there's like there's seven or eight of them. But, uh, um, you know, wh- one of them is um, not word for word, you know, not word translation, but sense translation. He, he really had very little patience for uh, the kind of fixation on um, every single word and, and finding a literal translation, partly because of his experience with uh, Bible translation. Um, and that kind of fixation on on uh, word for word accuracy uh, survives today in Korea. You know, Koreans today are crazy about it, and it's kind of ruining the um, I think uh, the reception of Korean literature and translation. Um, but for him, it was all about sense. So you know, he says, "Let the sense guide you, not the words." Um, you know, and his very final uh, I think uh, point is you know what was it uh, you know let uh, sort of trust in God as you translate. There was you know there was a kind of uh, very um, Christian uh, twist at the end. I don't have that document in front of me, but he had a very he had a very clear sense because you know that was basically his whole career was focused on translation. Um, some of it, well, I mean, every all translators have different philosophies, and so some of his uh, particular sort of guidelines might not um, you know ag- agree with other translators today, um, but. He definitely had a, a clear sense of, of what he thought he was doing. And that little taste that Ross has given you there about his thoughts on and his critical thoughts on the translation process from Korean to English was the topic of our first podcast, which I'll link below. So if you're interested in that and you want to go back in more detail, I'll link that below. Um, I, I should ask um, a question now, and it's a little bit like the Orientalist question I asked earlier. It's kind of a stain and perhaps an un, an unwelcome and an undeserved stain that has sat over Gale throughout the years. And that is that he is a pro-Japanese sympathizer of some sort. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, the the the, the accusation of of chinil, right, of being pro-Japanese, uh, is applied to missionaries across the board uh, by some people uh, because they basically had to find a way, they had to come to an agreement or an accommodation with the Japanese colonial authorities in order to work at all. And in Gail's and Gail's case, he has been, I think, unfairly. Um, you know, for, for a number of reasons, you know, A, he, you know, no one, he, he liked Han Moon, that, that, that's sort of a, a check mark against him. Uh, uh, B, uh, he said nice things about the Japanese and said very nasty things about the Koreans in the 1890s. So he published a couple uh, popular books that were almost really meant to be kind of uh, recruiting tools for bringing new missionaries to the field, uh, like Korean sketches and, and sort of these things were published even before 1900. So he'd barely been there a decade when he published these first two books. And those two books um, are the books that get all the attention. And the thing is, there's a like a, a complete sea change uh, in his thinking about what is you know what 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 is Han Moon good for right around the turn of the 20th century. And there's also uh, eventually, as with all of the missionaries, um, they I mean, first of all, all of the intellectuals that he worked with, the Korean intellectuals, and a lot of the the missionaries, they had high hopes for the Japanese. They thought that you know that they took the Japanese at their word. And, oh, because the Japanese said we're going to do all these great things, we're going to respect. You know the, the you know the Korean culture, blah blah blah, and of course you know uh, it soon became clear that that wasn't really going to be the case. And of course, where the big turning point for everyone, including Gale, was the March first uprising in 1919. Um, and you know, Gale, like everybody, was very disappointed uh, uh, with what Japan did. And but like all the other missionaries. He had to find a way to work with them, right? So I think um, there's been an unfair focus on his pre kind of 1900, even pre 1910 writings without an appreciation of all this other stuff he did after uh, 1910 until the time he retired. Um, and, and of course, nobody really knows much yet about um, all the, the archive that he left behind. I mean, he, he really, I mean, to me, um, I don't know how, if you or any of the people that are going to listen to this uh, will know the name of James Legg, but James Legg was this amazing um, Scottish missionary in Hong Kong, um, you know, about, 
60 years before Gale went to Korea, but, you know, and eventually became professor of Chinese at Oxford in, in the 1890s. You know, it's, I think of Gale as the leg uh, uh, of Korea, or what leg was to China and Chinese literature, because James Legge, you know, tr literally translated all the, the Chinese classics into English, and they're still used today by scholars. Um, so what, what leg was to China, Korea, um, uh, Gale was to Korea, and, uh, and there's even a recent book by a Korean scholar, which kind of annoys me because the, the title is, you know, uh, Gale, uh, you know, uh, Korea's Matteo Ricci, you know, and which is totally wrong. Because first of all, Matteo Ricci was a Jesuit. He was Catholic, you know, and, and Gale was not. And uh, I just think that's a better, uh, that leg is a better comparison. Um, but anyway, back to the, pro sorry, the Japanese thing. Yeah, I think it's unfair. Um, yeah, and so... Uh, uh, there's been a tendency to kind of slag off, get, oh, he's Orientalist, oh, he's pro, he's pro-Japanese, oh, he didn't care about the vernacular, and, and none of those are really true. Uh, with that comparison you made there, the, uh, something was pinging in my ear, and it's something I believe I heard you speak about, actually. I, I, I wonder, throughout all of Gale's um, writings and huge amounts of, of translation, uh, you used the phrase there, the classic works, and I wonder it, if he at any point throughout this um, his huge enterprise here nailed down a list of the Korean classics in some ways or a comprised list of the Korean classics or whether he just well, considered he, them he, all he, classics. Yeah, he didn't sort of, you know, write, you know, set out to write a list and say the following books are, are, are classics of Korean literature. But if you look, there were essentially three contemporaneous projects happening uh, in the starting from the early teens into the 1920s. Um, that uh, one by the Japanese, one by the Korean nationalists, and one by, you know, then one by Gale and his pundits, that were all excavating these old texts and reprinting them and or translating them. And what, what I have done, and again, this is not published yet, uh, but I've, I've, I've talked about it here and there, is um, if you look at the, the individual works that these three different projects were focusing on, and of course, they, they were all focusing on them for slightly different reasons, you know, the Japanese were translating them and republishing them essentially in order to, to, to convince young Koreans that they had nothing to be proud of in their, in their, in their past, and even said this explicitly in places. Uh, the, the Korean nationalists, Trey Nam Sun, were, were doing this uh, to convince Korean youth that there was, in fact, something really great to be proud of in their past, and Gail was doing it to convince his fellow missionaries and, and you know, the, the, the wider world that there was this great literary past. But if you look at the, the uh, if you sort of put side by side, if you juxtapose the different titles that each of these three different groups was looking at, um, that's where, um, if you distill that down, you get what is essentially the, um, a, a list of typical works that are now today considered to be classics of Korean literature. And that was kind of being thrashed out in the 19, well, for the first 20 years of the 20th century. So uh, three parallel projects, all with slightly different aims, but ultimately looking at the same works. And so, you know, the standard Chunhyangjan, Xingchangjan, Honggil, Dongjan, uh, um, you know, for, in terms of vernacular uh, works, Unyangjan, um, Mong, you know, for, for, for uh, fiction in, in Hanmun, in, in, in literary Sinetic. Um, uh, certain Yadam collections that Gail worked on, uh, uh, which actually the others didn't, uh, are now really considered important. Um, so they are all slightly different. Uh, Gail was not just sort of um, being parasitic on what the Japanese or the Koreans were doing. He, you know, he had his own sort of informants, if you will, or his own teachers that were showing him other texts um, that now today are also considered important. So it, it was clear who, you know, that the men he was working with had very uh, refined taste, uh, and he kind of uh, what he did essentially is a reflection of the the Korean intellectuals that were around him. What did his later life look like? Because I know he retired, I believe, to England and didn't stay in Korea. And I know that you've written about this. That this um, I'll get you to ex ex explain what his later life looks like. But it, it is important because, in some ways, it begins to give us a little bit of a hint into why in some ways his legacy was uh, at least partially forgotten. Right. So the reason everybody today uh, knows the name Underwood is because the Underwoods stayed on in Korea. You know, there have been multiple generations of them and they have sort of, uh, you know, multiplied and uh, they've got Yonsei there. 
Um, but uh, in, in some ways, the greatest tragedy of, of Gale's career is that he decided to retire to England. So 1927, it's time to retire. And it, he was choosing between two places. He, he was, it was either Victoria, here in British Columbia, right? basically you know, not far from where I am. Um, he was very attracted to Victoria, British Columbia, or is England. And uh, what tipped uh, uh, the balance in favor of going to England was that his son, George, was attending boarding school uh, in England. And his wife was also English. And her, well, I mean, she was a, a missionary brat from Japan, but her family was all based in England. So, you know, it started to be close to his son and then to be close to his wife's family. He said, okay, I'm going to go to England. But uh, the tragedy of it was that that immediately cut him off from his pundits, because without his pundits, um, he was really um, not very productive. I mean, and the fact that um, so much of his production, other than his kind of polishing of his Igubo translations in, trans in, in retirement, the fact that he really didn't do much of anything else, I think, just demonstrates how really dependent he was on the Korean intellectuals that he was working with. So that's kind of a tragedy. Why, but why, I mean, he, he was very busy in retirement. He, he was, uh, he was, he lived in the, the town of Bath. Yeah. When, mm. And he, in fact, he, he, the reason, and he chose specifically a house that used to be lived in by Charles Dickens. Um, and uh, which was kind of beyond his, his pay grade, but his wife was from a fairly well-off merchant family and they kind of covered the difference. So he got to live in a house that was formerly lived in by Charles Dickens and he would go around on the lecture tour. Um, uh, he, um, there are sort of uh, drafts, typed up drafts of different lectures that he gave while he was in retirement that are also quite interesting. Um, he uh, did a little bit, as I say, playing with uh, E. Gubo's materials while he was uh, in retirement. Um, but he, uh, that's where we find out, according to Richard Rutt, that he would occasionally enjoy a cigar or go around to go down to the pub and have a pint, you know, which are things that, of course, would be scandalous if he did in Korea um, on the job. Um, so I think he, he relaxed, um, but he definitely was cut off from the intellectual kind of vitality that um, was provided by his Korean pundit. Uh, another thing that you've said, and I think this is really important, uh, I believe you've touched on a little bit here, is that um, Gail, um, for all his enterprise, he really didn't have the backing, he, saw he didn't have the backing of a colonial power. And this is quite significant, was at this time, colonial powers were uh, really heavily involved in getting um, their uh, citizens around the world to do this type of work. And you, you indicate here that this may have been a very core reason why um, you this huge amount of documentation that you found, a huge amount of translation that he's done, sat idle and was never published. Right. So I think somewhere I define it as, uh, so it's a kind of missionary orientalism, but it's what I call allo metropolitan. So in other words, there was no colonial metropole, you know, behind him, um, funding him or otherwise needing his work because, um, you know, obviously there, there were, there was a, a whole army of, um, uh, Japanese uh, scholars and journalists that were resident in uh, the colony of Chosen that were, you know, churning out, you know, books and translations and kind of feeding that back into the colonial apparatus in Japan, I mean, in Korea, but also back to the metropole uh, in Tokyo, uh, just as, for example, you know, missionaries in India would do that, you know, back to, to England and so on. So, yeah, he was... Um, he didn't. He, he was basically all alone. I mean, he he had uh, you know no sources of funding. There was no government behind him. He wasn't beholden to um, a, a colonial administration. I mean, he was on cordial terms with the local um, colonial administration uh, in Korea. Um, because his wife spoke Japanese and they would get invited to lawn parties, you know, at the, at the, the governor general's place, which I think is another reason that he gets sometimes kind of uh, smeared as being all pro-Japanese. But, you know, if, if you're invited, you go. And, 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 he, and he, he wanted the books because they were publishing all these, these very expensively produced um, collections of inscriptions that he was also working on. And so, you know, he was in it for the books, I think. Uh, but um, yeah, he 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 was really um, kind of a free agent, if you will. The only kind of kingdom behind him was the kingdom of God. 
so that gave him a little bit of freedom. But on the other hand, as you note, uh, he just no one was interested. Uh, this was Korea was sort of out of outside of the strategic interests of the U.S. Uh, so American publishers weren't interested. I did, ditto for Great Britain. Uh, you know, people just didn't care. So it, it, it sort of sat, you know, in an archive. So as a final question here, I, and you've touched on the first part of this question a fair bit, but I, I'm really interested in the second part as well. I'm wondering um, what his legacy has been like in and outside of Korea. But I think more importantly, what do you think his legacy should be? Because I, 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 have, I don't think there is a, 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 a better expert on Gale than yourself. Certainly no one that has read as much well, of Gale as yourself. So that is a really interesting place to leave this, I think. Excellent question. Um, well, first of all, I mean, the short answer is his legacy is <clears throat> thus far uh, underappreciated. Uh, everybody knows his name in Korean studies. Uh, but I think there's still not a lot of um, recognition of just how much more he did. Um, but for example, if you look at, uh, you know, Bruce Cummings is one of our most distinguished historians of Korea today. He wrote his Korea's Place in the Sun. Gale is cited more than any single person in that book um, uh, in his sort of survey history of Korea. So clearly Gale kind of struck a chord with Bruce Cummings. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's still, I think it's early days. Um, we're, you know, trying to get out some of what he did just to make it more accessible. Uh, but partly because it is from Hanmun, you know, the number of students that would be interested are not, are not that many. On the other hand, you know, there are translations that he did and they're still, um, you know, you can read them with pleasure uh, today. So I, for me personally, the legacies, I feel like I have been learning um, literary synodic. I feel like I've been learning Hanmun from Gale and his pundits for the last, you know, 15 years. And I think we all have something to learn uh, from these texts. It's, you know, he put in a ton of work to produce them. And so this is why I'm insisting when we publish his, uh, when we edit and publish his um, various translations, and again, it's, it's, it's slow work, uh, that we do so, that we always include the originals and we chase down the originals and make sure that, um, you know, either in the footnotes or in the back of the book, uh, that the original is there too, so that everybody can see what he was doing, because it was honest work. I mean, you know, he made mistakes uh, like anybody, and of course, he didn't have the same resources. You know, he didn't have the internet. He didn't have, you know, even he was, for, you know, he's the one who wrote the dictionary for crying out loud, right? So he didn't have um, all the resources we have today. And considering that, what he did is, is just nothing short of astounding. So um, in essence, uh, he's, I think he deserves to be kind of the patron saint of Korean to English literary translation. I think he also deserves to be recognized as one of the founding figures of Korean studies, um, you know, in uh, the Anglophone world. And uh, I guess one way to end this would be to just point out that when he did pass away in 1937, was it? Um, you know, there, there were notices in the Korean newspapers back in Korea. And um, there was one uh, notice in particular, I think it might have been in the Chosan Ilbo, uh, where, you know, it says, you know, Chosan uh, Hage Koin. Uh, Gale, you know, the, the, uh, the giant of Korean studies of Chosan Hak, uh, Gale, you know, has passed away. And then there were appreciations by a number of very prominent individuals where they were basically saying that he was, you know, the giant of, of Korean studies, which uh, is a field, by the way, that is typically seen as beginning in the 1930s, this idea of Chosan Hak. And he was already doing it in the teens in the 1920s. So even within Korea, in some ways, he is one of, I think he deserves to be seen as one of the founding figures of Korean studies. And that is also, of course, a wonderful note to leave the podcast on. Um, below the podcast, I'm going to link um, to Ross's academic profile. You can go and read some of the articles that I used for today's research and uh, more work of it. It really is a really extensive list of research there. And I encourage you go, uh, yourselves to go and read it for yourselves. And I, of course, as I mentioned earlier, I am going to link below our previous podcasts. And uh on that, Ross King, thanks again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Jed. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. This is just a final reminder that we've made a conscious decision here on the Korean Out podcast not to run advertising. And so the podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. 
So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast at the PayPal or Patreon links attached below. Or importantly, you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And on that, I hope to see you again for the next episode. Thanks again for listening. (music) 